just do it in 284. Once again, good evening, everyone. It's Lynn Brown from head office in, at Immunitech. I'm the director of communication. You heard us doing a little testing there. And now we'll be starting our um, presentation with Dr. Jimmy Gutman in two minutes. We notice people are signing in and we're getting a fantastic attendance. We just finished the French call. That call went very, very well with a lot of attendance. So we can see that this is a very important topic and a very important presenter. Dr. Gutman, are you standing there waiting for to get started? I sure am. Okay, great. And we see uh, the attendees are still coming in. So we'll be starting in uh, about a minute and a half. And they're still coming in. OK, we've started recording. So I would say, Dr. Gutman, you could start your presentation now, and thank you. Are you ready to go, Dr. Gutman? Yes. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. So hi, everybody. It's uh, Jimmy Gutman here. Um, most of you know me. Um, those of you who don't, uh, I spend most of my time studying a single little molecule called glutathione. And this is what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at glutathione in health and disease. <coughs> now, for many of you, glutathione may be a strange and wonderful word, but uh, if you go out onto the street and ask anybody if they've heard about glutathione, most of them will look at you funny and wondering, what are you talking about? Uh, well, this is going to be changed in the next couple of years. When we first started doing our research on glutathione about 40 years ago, really only a couple dozen good articles uh, written on glutathione. But as of this year, in February 2012, we passed the landmark uh, we have now in our hands, have accessible to us over 100,000 articles on glutathione. And you can access these on the, the best uh, search engine for uh, medical and scientific articles called PubMed. And I welcome you to do that. Now, I'm going to take you back uh, over, well over 100 years ago. Uh, when glutathione was discovered. It was discovered by um, a French scientist, J. de Ray Palliad, and this was back in 1888. And he didn't name it glutathione, but he called it and considered it uh, coincident with the origin of life. And the reason why he did that is because every living tissue that he looked at whether it was from a human, an animal, an insect, or even a plant, contained this glutathione. So he knew that it was essential to life, but didn't call it glutathione. Well, uh, probably about 30, 40 years later, um, this is a British scientist, Sir Frederick Gowland Hopkins. Now look at the way this guy is dressed. If I ever went uh, to the clinic or the laboratory dressed like that, my wife would kill me. Uh, but he actually was able to further describe glutathione and actually gave it a name. And uh, 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 Sir Hopkins actually got the Nobel Prize in 1929. I'm going to move fast forward about 50 or 60 years. Um, this is Dr. Alton Meister. Most of the foundation work and the modern research done on glutathione is done by this gentleman. He's considered <coughs> the grandfather of modern-day glutathione biochemistry. He worked very closely with Dr. Anderson. I guess if he's the grandfather, she's got to be considered the grandmother. And they elaborated on the biochemistry. Uh, but they really didn't know all that much what glutathione did in your body. 
Well, a little bit later on, uh, there were a couple other uh, gentlemen, Dr. Dr. Julius and Dr. Lang, and what they started doing was measuring glutathione levels in different populations. And what they were able to determine, um, they kind of uh, took the lid off the, the magic uh, uh, box there and discovered that the higher the glutathione levels were, the healthier a person was going to be. The other thing that they discovered was that the older a person was and the more infirm they were, the lower their glutathione levels were. So this started to make uh, a, a little bit more sense. And sometimes when I show this slide, people want to know which one's glu Julius and which one's Lang. Uh, that neither one of them are those doctors. We go on in time, and uh, a very well-renowned scientist by the name of Dr. Wolf Droga, uh, he was an expert in aging, he was an expert in what we call free radical biology, he was an expert in antioxidants, and he was the first uh, person uh, to describe the effect of glutathione on the immune response in a living organism. And uh, since then, uh, Dr. Droga has published over 300 articles. I mean, this is a huge volume. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, any doctor walking around the hospital has published six articles, is walking and strutting like he's king of the world. Uh, Dr. Droga has published hundreds. And uh, we move on to uh, where we discovered how to raise glutathione with natural proteins. And in this case, it's Dr. Gustavo Bunos and Dr. Kongshavin uh, who discovered this product called Immunical. And Immunical is a natural protein that unlike drugs, uh, which have side effects, uh, Dr. Bunos and Kongshavin were able to raise glutathione on a sustained basis, uh, first in animals and then finally in human beings. And uh, their results were, were were uh, so impressive that other people um, uh, started uh, uh, repeating their work. And here is a picture of Dr. Luc Montagnier. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 2008 for his discovery of the AIDS virus. Uh, well, he started, uh, and some of his colleagues started looking at Immunical. And one of the books that he published, um, there's a whole chapter, not just on glutathione, but on Immunical specifically. So the people at Immunitech and Immunical were extremely proud of the type of uh, research associates that we've had uh, across the world, really uh, the best in the field. Now this might be the most important slide tonight. How do you raise glutathione? Well, you can raise glutathione by eating glutathione. If you eat glutathione, it's rapidly going to be broken down in your digestive tract and you'll end up with uh, just very expensive toilet water. Uh, glutathione has to be manufactured by your own cells. And the only way to do that is to give your cells the building blocks, or what we call precursors, so your cells can make glutathione. Now, there are a number of different uh, sources here. Of course, there's drugs, there's natural sources, uh, there's natural supplements, but let's look at some of these. Well, the drugs, the majority of these are uh, considered um, at the research stage, except for N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is probably the most commonly used drug to raise glutathione. Uh, N-acetylcysteine um, is uh, really a fantastic drug. Uh, I use it myself in the emergency department uh, if I've got to uh, take care of somebody with a nasty overdose or with fulminant uh, liver failure. Uh, but the problem with uh, NAC or N-acetylcysteine, just like so many other drugs, it's got a bunch of side effects. And people who receive N-acetylcysteine generally don't feel very well. But I'd rather have a sick person than a dead person. The other problem with the N-acetylcysteine is uh, that it only lasts a couple hours, what we call a short half-life. So uh, if you give it to a patient, it, it's gone in a few hours. So the only way to raise glutathione with N-acetylcysteine on a sustained basis uh, is to give it to them multiple times during the day. And if it made them feel sick the first time, it's going to make them feel five times as sick the fifth time. Now, of course, um, 
the best way to raise glutathione is with natural foods. But this is becoming very, very difficult these days. Uh, here we have uh, a picture uh, of a gentleman in the far north. Um, they've just uh, chopped up a whale and uh, fresh and bloody, he's eating it. Now, one of his cousins uh, back in the city has ordered uh, a nice uh, hamburger at a fast food joint. Now, this might look uh, more attractive to you and more palatable, but uh, trust me, uh, this fresh raw meat is far healthier and contains glutathione precursors. This doesn't. Now, unfortunately, we don't eat like that anymore. We can use vegetables. Well, the vegetables have to be raw. If you cook vegetables, you destroy the glutathione building blocks. You destroy the precursors. Now, why do I have a truck with vegetables? Because these days, that's how much vegetables you're going to have to eat to get a decent amount of glutathione precursors. Now, what we've done to our soils, what we've done to our plants, um, you know, the, the cauliflower that uh, you're going to pick up at the farmer's market this weekend is not at all like the cauliflower that your mom put on your plate when you were a kid. Eggs, but again, the eggs have to be raw, and eating raw eggs carries a serious risk. Uh, here in Quebec, where I'm uh, doing this broadcast from, um, probably a third of the eggs, if you were to culture them, uh, would culture positive for salmonella. So for health reasons, it's important to cook our eggs. We cook our eggs and we kill the glutathione precursors. Raw meat is another one. It's finally summer. Uh, we're going to be barbecuing. And if you like to barbecue your meat where it's still kind of red or blue inside, well, you're going to be getting some glutathione precursors. Uh, you're also probably going to be getting uh, far more cholesterol and fat and toxins and steroids and pesticides than you want too. So eating raw meat, that's a little limiting. Uh, if you like having sushi, um, well, you can eat sushi every meal. Uh, you will raise your glutathione, but uh, you'll probably also go broke. The best source of all for glutathione precursors is human mother's milk. Very, very easy to get once in your life. And of course, you can get glutathione precursors from animal milk too. Uh, here we see some cow's milk, but again, the milk must be raw. And in most of Canada and most of the United States, raw milk is even illegal to sell raw milk. You see, uh, milk, if it stands for too long, has a risk uh, of bacterial overgrowth. And the way to prevent uh, bacteria growing in milk, well, what do you do? Um, you pasteurize it. What is pasteurization? Pasteurization is heating and as we said before, if you heat these sensitive building blocks, they just don't work very well. And what Immunical does, it actually does use cow's milk. It is very, very fussy about uh, the cows we use right now. We're only using one herd in all of North America. It comes from a state uh, where the uh, uh, pollution levels are extremely low. Uh, we, we, we check for uh, toxins, pesticides, herbicides. If uh, these cows receive any antibiotics, we test for that. If we find any antibiotics or anything like that, we reject the entire load. And just to, to give you an idea how concentrated this is, um, well, if you want to try to do this by getting raw milk, you would have to park yourself underneath a cow uh, for like two weeks uh, to get what you're going to find uh, in a box of a Munich cow. It takes over 500 liters that's like 125 gallons uh, to make a kilo of this particular whey protein isolate. But what about natural products? Well, we already told you that oral glutathione, that just doesn't work. Lots of studies have shown that you, if you eat glutathione, it doesn't raise glutathione. Uh, cysteine is an important part of glutathione, but if you just eat cysteine, and you could find cysteine supplements, they're no good either. If it's a free amino acid cysteine, it becomes rapidly oxidized and in fact can make you ill. The cysteine has to be part of a larger protein. Uh, methionine, some people have heard of methionine, an essential amino acid, is a gl glutathione precursor, but it's also a precursor for homocysteine. Homocysteine is a risk factor 
or cardiac disease. So we don't use that. Uh, melatonin will raise glutathione in the brain a bit. Uh, lipoic acid uh, will work for a short while, but then backfire. Uh, all of you people who practice natural medicine and herbal medicine know that milk thistle uh, can raise glutathione levels a little bit. The active ingredient in the milk thistle is acilimarin. Um, but really, we need to get uh, to what we call a patented whey protein isolate, whereby we're able to take the specific proteins out of milk, keep them in a undenatured state, in other words, uh, avoid heating, avoid mechanical damage, and then you've got yourself a glutathione precursor. Now, glutathione, you know, if I were to speak to uh, a group of doctors, uh, I would talk about a dozen different things that glutathione does inside of your cell, most of which uh, would put you to sleep in five minutes. But tonight, if you can remember three things represented by the word AID, well, then you'll have 95% uh, knowledge of what glutathione does. A stands for antioxidants, I stands for the immune system, and D stands for detoxification. Let's look at antioxidants. Well, we all know about antioxidants and their importance in literally hundreds of disease processes. Uh, this is uh, uh, so important that a whole new field of medicine has started just looking at antioxidants and health. We call that free radical biology. Well, if we're going to be talking about antioxidants, we also need to talk about oxidants. We need to know what oxidation is. If you leave a, a bunch of uh, metal or nails uh, outside for a couple of weeks, they're going to rust. This is oxidation. If you leave a tub of butter out in the sun, it's going to become rancid. This, too, is oxidation. What happens when you cut an apple in half and leave it on the counter? It turns brown. Also, oxidation. Well, am I saying that we're rusting, getting rancid, and turning brown? Actually, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, if you look at the back of this uh, older woman's hand, you'll see these dark spots, which people call liver spots. Well, it's not a accurate name. It has nothing to do with the liver, but it has everything to do with the fact that this woman's tissues are oxidating. They're turning brown, rancid, and rusty. Now, do I really care that she's got spots in the back of her hand? Not so much. But the same process is taking place in her brain, in her heart, in her liver. So we've got to do something about it. And this is what free radical biology is all about, the study of antioxidants and oxidation and what uh, we can do. And there are literally hundreds of different disease processes where antioxidants um, can either prevent or even treat a problem. So oxidation, how does this take place? Well, if we're breathing, if we're eating, if we're exercising, if we're alive, we produce a toxic molecule called a free radical. It's kind of the pollution that's produced by your cell. And these free, radical, uh, free radicals are nasty little uh, molecules. Not only do they cause damage to themselves, but if they touch another molecule, they can turn it into a free radical as well. Now, this uh, free radical production is an unfortunate consequence of life. We all produce these things. Here we see a bunch of free radicals and next to it, some healthy cells. And look what happens. Free radical drift towards the cell and up, touches the cell, and after a while, fills the cell with other free radicals. So you end up with a damaged cell. And of course, that cell is touching another cell, and that cell is touching another cell. And what you end up with, there you go, one of those black spots on the back of your hand or in your brain. So our bodies have a way of dealing with this. And the the way we deal with these free radicals is by using antioxidants. Here we see vitamin C uh, looking suspiciously like a Pac-Man. Uh, vitamin C, I use that because it's probably the best known antioxidant. And watch what the vitamin C does. Vitamin C will go ahead and in its little Pac-Man mouth actually chomp onto a free radical. And what happens, the vitamin C neutralizes the free radical. The problem is the vitamin C, its mouth is full, it's also neutralized. 
And at this point in time, if nothing else were to happen, we would just pee out this oxidant-antioxidant complex. Anybody knows uh, the color of your urine after you take a vitamin C pill or after you take a multivitamin, you notice that it's quite yellow or quite orange. You're, you're actually peeing out this antioxidant free radical complex. Now, if that was the case, if that happened all the time, we'd have to be eating oranges, grapefruits, all day long. But there's a mechanism in place that, that our bodies have. It's in incredibly eloquent uh, that can spare this. Up to this point, uh, many of the people who have studied biology and biochemistry and, and pharmacy and uh, all of you other keeners, this is not news to you, what I've shown you. What I'm going to show you now is new to most people. What the vitamin C molecule can do, it can come across a glutathione molecule or a series of glutathione molecules. And look what happens. The vitamin C will hand off the free radical to the glutathione molecule, whereby it becomes liberated. It is now able to continue its work and continues doing this ad infinitum. So what we've done by having glutathione in our cells was we can recycle vitamin C. We can recharge vitamin C so that it just doesn't get peed out of your body. Now, is it just vitamin C? No. Every single antioxidant we know of, and we know of over 4,000 different antioxidants, all of them use the same process. Here's the key, that without glutathione, the whole process of oxidation and antioxidation, that whole thing would shut down. And this is why we call glutathione the master antioxidant. I'm just going to fast forward here um, to save a little bit of time. I stands for the immune system, remember AID. Uh, why do we have an immune system? Uh, we have an immune system to protect us from things that are not supposed to be in our body, what we call a foreign antigen. Uh, here we see some bacteria. Uh, here we see some fungus, a virus, a parasite. Uh, our bodies are teeming with these creatures. Uh, we're probably carrying between four and five pounds of these creatures. And why is it that we aren't falling sick? Well, our immune system is in place to make sure that these things are kept in control. The immune system keeps these microorganisms, these, these little bugs in control, but not just bugs. Uh, here's a, a great slide. Uh, here, this big old white ball there, that's a tumor cell. And right next to it, this gray structure, is what we call a white blood cell, a lymphocyte. And what this white blood cell is, is, it's a, one of the frontline soldiers of our immune system. It's attached onto the tumor cell and it's about to break it down. So it's not just living organisms like bacteria, but even tumor cells. Uh, uh, I'll throw a little quiz at you just to get you guys uh, scratching your heads. How many of these tumor cells would you imagine exist in our body at any one time, like right now? Well, on average, believe it or not, uh, we probably got about a million of these tuber cells swimming around. Uh, you know, the smokers, uh, probably more. The older people, probably more. The young, healthy people, less. Um, but why is it that you're not going to have to run to me or any other doctor in a couple months with cancer? Because your immune system is there, constantly on guard, finding these abnormal cells and getting rid of them. People with a weak immune system are much more prone to the development of cancer. So I'm going to show you how the immune system works. I'm going to give you a course in immunology. Uh, you doctors out there, please forgive me. I'm going to teach you immunology in 90 seconds. And our subject tonight is uh, our President Obama. Uh, everybody knows President Obama. Uh, very friendly guy. Uh, tonight he's probably out there campaigning. Uh, shaking hands uh, with all kinds of people. Uh, the problem is when you're in a crowd like that shaking hands, somebody is going to leave a small glob of a viral secretion on Obama's finger. And then Obama is going to either rub his nose, scratch his eye, touch his ear, and it, this gives that viral particle 
the opportunity to enter into his bloodstream. And you see very quickly surrounded by those frontline soldiers, those white blood cells that are going to seek and try to destroy this viral particle. A viral particle. Uh, in 15 or 20 minutes, Obama might be uh, uh, loaded with uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viral particles. But he's only got so many soldiers. He's only got so many white blood cells. How can he possibly take on a large threat like that? Well, the white blood cells will start making copies of themselves. They'll start duplicating themselves. They'll start cloning themselves. This almost looks like multi-level marketing here, doesn't it? Um, these white blood cells can, can actually multiply themselves about 500 times. That does not mean 500 white blood cells. It's 500 multiplications. If you've got a calculator in your hand, you don't have enough room on the screen of the calculator to accept that number. Now here's the punchline. Without glutathione, this whole process here fails. Uh, the cloning of these white blood cells just slows down and comes to a stop. People with low glutathione levels are immunocompromised. They cannot fight off infections adequately. So you need to think of glutathione literally as food or fuel for your immune system. Finally, D for detoxification, something everybody's concerned about. Um, when I was uh, an emergency doctor, I knew about glutathione because uh, I would use it to take care of certain drug overdoses. And uh, I would use a drug, N-acetylcysteine, to raise glutathione. And unfortunately, my patients all fell sick on it, uh, but it was very effective. But as an emergency doctor, I knew about these certain overdoses. But what I didn't know, uh, check out this list. I mean, if, if your computer screen went all the way down to the floor, I could fill it uh, with stuff that you are exposed to uh, every day of every week. Uh, things that you eat, things that you breathe, things that you drink, and glutathione is absolutely critical for getting rid of these things. Things like automobile exhaust and cigarette smoke and uh, all the junk that our, our industry spews out into the environment and pesticides and herbicides. And, and I have a picture of fish there because we eat fish. Unfortunately, we're probably also eating heavy metals like mercury and lead. You know, every time you've got a barbecue in the backyard. I mean, great, it's summer now, we're going to be barbecuing, but uh, uh, when you're eating the stuff off your barbecue, you're eating a bunch of carcinogens, uh, which are only eliminated by glutathione. Every time you have a hot dog, every time you clean your house, and on and on and on. And, on. and by no coincidence, the highest levels of glutathione to be found in your body is in your liver, which is, after all, your major organ of detoxification. So there you go. If you remember the AID, aid for your immune system, A stands for the master antioxidant, I stands for think of food for your immune system, and D stands for detoxification next to water, probably the most important detoxification substance you have in your body. And the problem is that there are so many things that tax into our glutathione levels. Uh, drugs and injury and infection and um, as the glutathione levels drop, you end up with more oxidation, more free radicals, more toxins. Glutathione continues to plummet and you end up with a weak cell, a sick cell, and worst case scenario, a dead cell. So we have to do everything we can to reestablish our glutathione levels and the way to do that, the only patented natural product uh, in North America and the world, uh, proven and clinically proven to, to raise glutathione levels and to sustain a, an immune response is this Immunical, which is a, uh, a protein glutathione precursor. Uh, it's been around for many, many years. It's been on the market for about 15 or 16, but the research has been ongoing almost 40 years. Um, over a million people have ingested this, which is uh, uh, great uh, for the company, but also great because we know what to expect, uh, indications, contraindications, side effects, uh, which are very, very few. And uh, thoroughly studied uh, the, the difference between this natural product and 99% and, and of the other 
things that you're going to find out there. Uh, we actually have published clinical articles written specifically on the product Immunical. We're not talking about a, an area in general. We're talking about studies done with this specific product, and not just in a test tube, not just in a mouse, not just in a rat, but in humans, uh, in, in large studies, in what we call double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, studies. Uh, very, very difficult and expensive task, and this is a company that continues to pour millions of dollars every year into ongoing research. Uh, you can find uh, Immunical uh, in either one of these two books. This is an American book called a PDR, Physician's Desk Reference. This is a Canadian book called a CPS. Uh, now, the interesting thing about these two books is they contain all the drugs that a doctor can prescribe. But if you turn to the I section, you'll find this non-drug, something called Immunical. And it's written just like a drug, except it's not a drug, it's a natural protein. Indications, contraindications. And you will find one of these books on the desktop of every single doctor and every single pharmacist in North America. So don't be shy to ask your doctor or your pharmacist, you know, is this a good thing for me to take? They may not know about the Munical. Once they crack that book open, well, just watch their jaw drop. So there you have it, uh, Immunical, uh, second to none. Um, I, I think uh, we are uh, definitely the leaders in the immune segment of the market, but now uh, we're, we're moving into the very healthy people. We're, we're very, very popular uh, in the athletic realm. Uh, we're popular for people trying to increase not just their physical um, uh, abilities, but their mental abilities. Uh, there isn't a single person in the world that cannot benefit uh, by taking this product, uh, this very, very important uh, and rare glutathione precursor we call Immunical. So hopefully uh, somebody out there has uh, uh, picked up some information tonight. I hope uh, uh, you've learned something, uh, maybe uh, been entertained a bit. And with all that, uh, I'm going to wish you good health, and I'm going to hand the reins uh, back over to Lynn Poole Brown. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gutman. I can tell you, you had a huge attendance here this evening. And to all those attending, we have recorded this um, uh, presentation this evening, and we will be putting it in the back office tomorrow. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Dr. Gutman. Thank you to all the participants. Um, as far away as Ireland, I noticed. Hi, Willie. And um, that's it for tonight. We'll Talk to you all very soon at the next webinar. Good night.